Welcome back. I'm talking to Jim Kelly, who was incarcerated in Carstairs um, Psychiatric Hospital, which yep. is... Yep. Maximum security. Maximum security, which is, is basically just it's a prison. Prison, no. Um, he wasn't charged with any crime, and there's no evidence that he's got anything wrong with him mentally. Uh, and, that, and that was even stated to you by one of the psychiatrists that examined you. Yep. Just remind us who, who the name of that one was. Yeah, that would be Dr. Janie Connaughton. Jenny Connaughton. Yeah. She, what she said there was nothing wrong with your psyche. Yeah. Well, when I read the reports, uh, um, right. her first findings, and it wasn't until years later I, I managed to access that report. Mm -hmm. um, she saw no signs of symptoms of mental illness in me. Right. Okay. Now, now, she, after you were um, basically submitted to the psychiatric uh, unit, uh, for which in, in which you spent nine and a half years, yeah. uh, you lost your kids. Your wife, no, your no, life, no, completely. Marriage, yeah. uh -huh. um, and this was from 1997 to 2006. Uh, and shortly after you were um, put in there, you found that the police forensics uh, had basically cordoned off your house yeah. uh, and were searching it like some crime yeah, scene type thing. Yeah, that's, that's, that was the impression that I got. Which I don't right, been how did there. you find that out? Um, well, my ex-wife and wife at the time she contacted me and said that they had been offered a new house because mm -hmm. uh, our house had been taken apart right. literally taken apart you know, behind the the plaster boards underneath the floorboards they'd ripped the place upside down what they were looking for i do not know mm. oh, i can surmise what they were, they, they were saying they were looking for but uh, right no, uh, no, no, now the other thing that you found out about which was basically not long after you were put in here your best friend Christopher McGrory was murdered. Yeah, that's just true. tell us about that. Yeah, um, I was called aside by a, a female nurse, and, and she says I've got some sad news for you. And I'm thinking, well, what, what next? No, and mm -hmm. she says your your wife's just been off the phone, and then she's disclosed information that your friend Christopher McGrory he was found murdered last night mm -hmm. uh, in his van. So his warnings to you back in July about the fact that he's saying yeah. he was being followed by MI5 and he was worried about his life, he wasn't joking, was no, he? I, no, that's what I'm saying. That's, that's, uh... Right. So uh, and has that murder case ever been solved? No, it has not. Right. And uh, Jim did has shown me um, a newspaper clipping from somebody called Christopher McGrory who was indeed murdered yeah. at that time. So yeah. this is a guy in his mid-20s and he had some connections with... With Dublin, he went. He was went over to Ireland regular, and uh, the two of you were Glasgow Celtic fans. Yeah, and yeah. We'd go we, to the match together. We played, we played football. We went to went to support Celtic. Uh, we kind of go lucky. But Christopher was a type of man who he had friends within the, the farming community mm -hmm. uh, in the outskirts of Glasgow, and they'd done a lot of uh, work f uh, to, in Dublin, like mm -hmm. with the Irish. Uh, back and forward, it was always back and forward to Ireland. No, not that I was ever there. He, did, mm. he just said it was like uh, business. Now, after you'd been in this mental institution or whatever you want to call it, mental hospital, for about three weeks, it sort of started to dawn on you what you might have been being used for, because you thought maybe that they were trying to make out you. So you were some kind of IRA terrorist, yeah. Yeah. and you became aware of this uh, firearms offence. Um, from one of the psychiatrists who said to you, uh, hey Jim, don't worry about the firearms offence, I, I, I can get you off that. And yeah, you, so you yeah. said, what it, firearms offence? I was totally astonished, astonished with the, the, the statement. They said that he'd been in contact with uh, uh, Mrs Diver, I think her name was, who was uh, the head procurator of Fisco, I think, in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. And he, he said that she had... Uh, they'd managed to come to an arrangement about getting charges dropped for a, mm -hmm. a firearms offence. And I was totally flabbergasted. Mm -hmm. Richard, I'm like, what's this? I do not know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. He said, don't, don't worry about it. It's nothing to worry about. It's nothing to be concerned. You're not going to be here long. Right. It's okay. Don't panic. You'll be okay. And that was the last I seen right. it. So when that happened, uh, he, the guy, never, he never really came into contact really anywhere with me, that, that psychiatrist. No. So now, there were a number of psychiatrists who were supposedly looking after you while you were in there. Yeah. But basically, they're employed by the state. They've, they've clearly been told b um, by the police, and you found this out at some later date, the British Transport Police, yeah. that 
you were in there because you were linked to this firearms offence, which you, you actually know nothing about, no. and they were there to basically oversee you. Yeah. So let's just look at some of the, just mention some of these psychiatrists who you liaised with while you were in there for nine and a half years. We've got psychiatrist Dr. Thomas White. Yeah. So just tell us about him. Yeah, that's the psychiatrist who informed me about the, uh, the conversation that he had. A phone call to the Procurator Fisco about uh, this allegation of charges, so-called charges, a so-called incident uh, on the 1st of September mm -hmm. at uh, Glasgow Central Station. And as I say, I was astonished. I didn't realise the significance of that, Richard, mm -hmm. and how that part played the major role in getting me to the State Hospital in the first place. Right. And it wasn't until maybe uh, a long time later that I realised that uh, that fabrication did take me to the State Hospital. Right, and uh, this was because y you submitted something under Freedom of Information and found um, a particular document. Yeah, yeah. So just tell us about that. Yeah, I I'd managed to find out that this uh, Detective uh, Inspector Rogers this is Detective Inspector Rogers uh, yep. of the British Transport Police based in yeah. Glasgow. Yeah, it's uh, based at uh, British Transport Police headquarters and that's in Cowcaddens, Glasgow. Cowcaddens. Cowcaddens, Glasgow. So yeah. it's, uh, it's in the Glasgow City Centre. So, yeah. so he basically, just, just read out what, yeah. what he put in his report to the psychiatrist. Sure. Well, when I found out he, what he'd been saying, uh, I, I took it upon myself you know, to challenge what he was saying, mm -hmm. to clarify it, because I needed him to clarify it. If I could get him to clarify it, then I could prove, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. that his allegation was wrong, and then right. I would believe it, get, I would get my freedom ultimately. But I wrote to him anyway at his location, and I said, Dear Mr Rogers, my name is Mr Jim Kelly, I'm contacting you personally concerning information that has only came available to me uh, recently via a confidential and restricted medical file which pertains to my incarceration at my location, the State Hospital. I said I have in my possession written documentation which states that you falsely and a verbal communication with a Dr Connaughton from the State Hospital implicated me personally in an alleged serious crime against an unnamed individual within the confines of Glasgow Central Station on the 1st of September 1997. And it has also came to my attention that while I was in Leverndale Hospital in the month of September 1997, you made such allegations to the doctors as that to give a false impression that criminal charges were imminent in being made against myself for a very extremely serious offence. You also went on record as stating that I would not be getting bail for this said alleged serious crime should I be released from Leverndale. You did, Detective Inspector, request that nursing staff at Leverndale Hospitals Ward 1 do not pass inadvertently on any details of this alleged crime until you had interviewed me personally. As we both know, British Transport Police and you have never interviewed me about any alleged criminal act. Right. So he's trying to stop anyone ask, get, getting information yeah. to you about yeah. this supposed crime which supposedly took place on the 1st of September yeah. involving firearms yeah. in 1997. Now, if anyone out there knows of a Detective Inspector Rogers, you don't have a first name, no, no. who was in the British Transport Police based in... Uh, uh, Cook Adams, Glasgow. In Glasgow. Uh, in 1997, we'd like to hear from you. We'd like to trace this Detective Inspector Rogers because uh, he needs to be arrested for perverting the course of justice. Yeah. Uh, because he, he's come up with this yeah. phantom crime and, and this has caused you to be locked up in a mental institution for nine and a half years. Yeah, I, I, I further went on, uh, Richard, to say to him in the letter, you know what I mean, that I'd written to the Crown Office, you know, and I was, I was asking for clarification on whether an actual crime did occur mm -hmm. on the date that he narrated. Because uh, this matter, Mr Rogers, has had serious implications on my life as a whole. Mm -hmm. I was brought to the State Hospital soon after he made that scandalous allegation against myself and there I've remained in the State Hospital since, since September 1997. I am now in a position, Detective Inspector, to have this matter brought to the relevant authoritative bodies for a full and partial investigation concerning all aspects and my subsequent transfer to the State Hospital in 1997. 
and I said to him, I would be most grateful if you could now, under the Data Protection Act and also under the UK Freedom of Information Act, please make available all evidence, including statements from this alleged reported crime. It is very important that you now make available this information that gave you justification to implicate and incriminate me in an alleged serious crime. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you would agree, Detective Inspector, that as in any court matter relating to a serious criminal allegation, the police and the prosecution are duty bound to substantiate and corroborate such criminal allegations. Yeah. It is very likely, Mr Rogers, this case will hopefully in some time in the near future go to the Supreme Court. Yeah. And just to recap, you were never arrested and you've no. never been charged, you've, no, you've no. never had any uh, no. judici judicial uh, no. process or anything like that. Now, no. now, let's just, you said that when you were being followed that, that you felt that it came to a peak the activity of them on your back on oh, the 30th of yeah, August, you yeah, said. Yeah. And, th and this crime is alleged to have taken place on the 1st of September, this phantom crime. Sure. Now, something quite significant happened on the 31st of August. Yeah. Yeah. yeah which Prince, was? Yeah, Princess Diana mysteriously died. Right. And a lot of people think she was murdered. Oh, yeah, yeah. Probably by MI5 or MI6. Yeah, that's what I think. Right. And so you, you, you mm. strongly believe that you were being set up as some supposed IRA terrorist yeah. so that the security services could say, no, we weren't in France, we were in Glasgow chasing these IRA guys and we've even got one of them in, uh, in a mental institution to prove it. Yeah, uh, that, that that's something they could put forward to a politician or a, or a parliamentary committee to say, this, this is what yeah. our whole security service operation was at that time in 1997, it's a, you think it's a diversion yeah, tactic. Exactly, Richard. I mean, they are supposedly accountable to Parliament, and certain mm. elements within that, whether it be the Common Security Select Committee mm. or the Home Secretary, who was John Reid at the time. So they're accountable. So when such an incident happens, like the death of Princess Diana, and an incident that rocked the nation, yeah. no, it really rocked the nation, yeah. then the I mean, if, if they did do something like that, it's going to, to be. They're they're going to, it's going to be belt and braces. They're yeah, going they're, going to make, to, they're going to have cover up and, and yeah. diversion and what have yeah. you. Yeah, it's, it's it, the way I look at it is they're looking at a clean skin, maybe a couple of clean skins that they can turn around and say with no connections, official connections to any upfront terrorist organisation, but they could have turned around and say some kind of real IRA or a splinter group part of that, mm. and, and they were active and they were going to do this, they were going to do that, and we were watching them. So, well, it's like, I've always, and I've thought about this, it's like most, I think when an atrocity or a tragedy like that happens, or they're up to no good, mm. then they use Scotland as a bolt hole, mm. do you know? A and bolt it, hole. A bolt hole. It's, it could be similar to the 7-7. Yeah. Where the su security services were supposedly all up in Scotland. Yeah. Securing the GH. That's right. So you describe Scotland as a bolt hole. Bolt hole. So they can say, well, we were all up there doing this operation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, regardless of whether the, what happened to you was a diversion uh, from the, the Diana thing, uh, regardless of that, it's still a most heinous thing that's happened to you that you've had no justice. No, uh, no, and it's, uh, uh, it's one of the ones, Richard, that uh, I've had to live with it and I've always had to live with it. Even coming to approach you on it, yeah. when I was coming to you, you know what I mean, in March, uh, I was I mean, threatened with my life, yeah. no, I mean, if, should I come anywhere near you or Ian Crane, then they would kill me. It, it's wiped out probably the most important years of your life with your children. Yeah, it, it, that, it, that, was, that was the most mid hurtful Mid-30s to yeah. mid-40s, you, yeah. you know, you, yeah. I'm still alive, Richard, that's the thing, and right. uh, I'm grateful that I'm still alive. Well, you need justice though, Jim. Okay, now let's just mention some of these other psychiatrists who were looking after you when you were in this... Uh, prison basically, um, Dr John Donnelly. He's like a, a psychologist, right. which is a different thing from a psychiatrist, yeah. and, but he can assess people's uh, character for social traits, personality disorders, mm -hmm. uh, if they're safe for they're a psychopathic. Uh, he came back with his report on the sense that he could see no signs or symptoms of personality disorder or any psychopathic right. traits. Right, and he said that the only reason why you were being held there was because of this supposed event on the 1st of September at Glasgow Central Station. Yeah, well, most, most of them, they, they did say, they, they stated that the incident, that all, I was there because they had to evaluate and risk assess like everybody else that's caught up in that system, mm -hmm. and that was the main thing that held me, that kept me in maximum security. Do you take that away, then 
you're just a head case, you know what I mean, who could be dealt with in the community and a local level. Mm -hmm. You don't come to Carstairs because you say you've been followed by MI5. The most maximum, maximum, maximum security. security. Yeah. And you, in the year 2000, you had a new psychiatrist called Dr. Gibb, who, again, said that he thought that you were being detained illegally. Uh, and he said, um, how have I been landed with you? He asked, and then smiling, he said, is it anything to do with aliens? Yeah, well, he knows. He's, he's the first one who comes and, and, and engages me. Um, he was Scottish, but he did his first words saying, I don't know how I've been landed with you. But he was quite camp and up front, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I felt that, that yeah, mm -hmm. this, this guy seems okay here, you know what I mean? He's, I mean, at the time I was more interested that I wasn't wanting to force any medication on me, mm -hmm. because they knew that if they took that on, I wouldn't believe it to think, Richard, they would just uh, turn me into a vegetable, like they did a lot of people in there. Right. I mean, that system is that different. It's not like the prison environment. In the prison environment, they don't drag you into a cupboard and inject you with mind-numbing substances, mm -hmm. you know, or, or throw you in padded cells. That's the difference here, not right. so you, you've got to be, but he said, he was up front, he said, Jim, I don't know why I've been landed with you, he says, has it got anything to do with aliens? Mm -hmm. You know, and I says, no, it's got nothing to do with aliens, he went, okay. I, he says, I'm going to be honest with you, he says, I'm employed by the Secretary of State, which is the government, and if the government said that I had to keep you in here for your own safety, then I would have to do that. You understand? I says, yes. When I was surprised what he was saying to me, right. I says, yes, I, I, yeah, yeah, I understand. He says, you give me two years. Two years is a long time. He says, I've already done three. You give me two years and uh, I'll get back to you and I'll promise that I will move you on to uh, training for freedom, rehabilitation. Right. Now, you, you started um, to try and educate yourself in computers and, and email and all the rest of it yeah. so that you could start sending out messages to try and get some justice. Yeah. Um, you also approached the European Court of Human Rights uh, who told you, well, you must go through all of the other courts in the UK first before you come to us. Yeah. And you said, well, they're not giving me legal aid and oh. it's, it's the state that, that has carried out this injustice, so that you're the only court I can go to. Yeah. And yeah. they eventually dropped your case. Um, but after that, they sent a party of officials to uh, the hospital where you were. Yeah. Okay, so you're trapped in this. Effectively, it's a prison gym, isn't it? Yeah. We, we, oh, we yeah. call them mental hospitals, but you're in a cell with very little in it. Once they made their assessment and their report on it, and they said, well, he's not being released, they're not releasing him, he's, we'll move him on to another ward. And once I'm in that ward, it takes them a couple of years to assess me professionally. So when it comes to the end of the couple of years, they start, the, the nursing staff in the ward start to say, there's nothing really wrong with this character, no. He may be yeah, a bit uh, obtuse or uh, aloof or non-communicative, you know I mean? but he's not really shown any signs or saying anything that a paranoid schizophrenic would know, like mm -hmm. the rest of them. So what their, their action is, what they do is, they offload me to another unit mm -hmm. where this process can start again. When another two years goes by and then when the same time comes in, they put me on to somebody else. So it, it's like a, what they call ghost you. They'll mm -hmm. ghost you about that, that right. whole institution. And, and in, I think, what was it, about 2003, you wrote to all of the MPs in the UK? Yeah, yeah. This, uh -huh. is, this is a list here that, that, that Jim wrote to, to basically try and explain what he's explaining to you now, and uh, but you said about 45% of them gave you a reply, yeah, yeah. including John Major. Yeah. Any other notables? Oh, well, I'm f well, it was, it was kind Margaret of Beckett. Margaret Beckett. Right. She was. I think she was the only person from the uh, the cabinet. The, from the cabinet. Uh, from so it was Tony, 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 Blair's, time. Tony Blair's time. No, yeah. he was. She was the only person that really. It got back to me. Right. And the other and, person. And, but what did she say then? What, what, what? She thanked me for getting back to her and notifying her about it. And she, but she seemed very, as if to say, we didn't know about this, you know what I mean? But you brought it to her attention and I really appreciate that. Whereas the rest of them didn't. But as I say, when you have people like uh, John Major and then you get people like Jerry Adams acknowledging the letter. Yeah, because you just wrote to all of them. I, looked, I wrote to them all. The whole lot. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe it was a mistake to write to Jerry Adams. But no, well, no, well, he's, well, he's in there. I didn't yeah, know. I, I mean, mean, this is a list of, of yeah, Jerry Adams is in it, aye. 600 and odd um, politicians that you wrote to. Yeah. But we'll, we'll discuss this um, more after this quick break. <laughs>